appreciate that. So I'd like to welcome everyone to the um, this is the webinar series of the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, CSIAC. Today's presentation is entitled Agile, Energy Efficient, and Trustworthy Intelligence at the Edge. My name is Steve Warzala. I'm the CSIAC Outreach Manager. Good administrative notes before we begin. Uh, phones have been muted except for presenters. Uh, questions can be asked at any time during the presentation by utilizing the chat function. And time permitting, your questions will be answered at the end of the session. Uh, today's briefing slides will be posted on our website within a few days. Finally, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank our sponsor, the Defense Technical Information Center, DTEC. Funding that DTEC provides enables CSIAC to conduct these webinars. It's my pleasure to introduce the presenter for today's webinar. That's Dr. Corey Merkel. Dr. Merkel is an assistant professor with the Department of Computer Engineering at the Rochester Institute of Technology. From 2016 to 2018, uh, Corey was a research electronics engineer with the uh, Information Directorate uh, as part of the Air Force Research Laboratory. His current research focuses on mapping, um, focuses on mapping of AI algorithms, uh, primarily artificial neural networks, to mixed signal hardware and design of brain-inspired computing systems using emerging technologies and trustworthy AI hardware. Dr. Merkel's research has been published in a number of peer-reviewed conferences, journals, and books. He earned his uh, BS and S degrees in computer engineering and a PhD in microsystems engineering, uh, all from RIT. We'll now per turn the presentation on to Dr. Merkel. Good afternoon, Corey. The floor is now yours. All right, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I, I want to thank uh, Steve Warzala and John Reed and Joe Caroli for inviting me uh, to give this, this webinar. So the first webinar I've ever done, so this is uh, uh, kind of exciting. So what I want to talk about uh, today is some of the research I've been doing uh, really since I started my PhD uh, back at RIT in, in the early 2010s. And then uh, you know, that continued through uh, my time at the Air Force Research Lab and now as a faculty uh, member at RIT. So, after a brief inter uh, introduction, uh, we'll take a look at some of uh, the different research uh, areas that uh, our group focuses on uh, most heavily. And so those are essentially uh, circuits for artificial neural networks, um, random artificial neural network uh, topologies, and then stochastic uh, information representation techniques uh, in artificial neural networks. So it should be, I think, maybe no surprise uh, to this group that the big data landscape is uh, continually growing. So AI is a really hot area right now. And there are a number uh, of, of companies and, and government agencies uh, and universities that are heavily investing uh, in, uh, in AI either as a means to uh, enhance their products or uh, for curiosity reasons, right, to basically get at why uh, humans learn uh, the way they do, or to um, further some of the technological advancements that are required, you know, to keep our, uh, to keep our country safe and to make sure that we have the best uh, technical edge uh, in that arena. So, up until maybe about 2012, we had this sort of uh, interesting dilemma where a number of uh, deep learning algorithms existed, but they couldn't really handle the amount of data that we were throwing at them. And really, AI took off in 2012 when we were able to uh, 
for the first time demonstrate uh, very efficient methods of learning with the vast amount of data uh, that was available. And from then on, we've, we've seen this sort of uh, continual advancement in the numbers of, uh, uh, of algorithms, in uh, data set collection, and in a number of other dimensions of AI. But even given that, the human brain, uh, as it turns out, still vastly outperforms AI, uh, even in very simple tasks like image classification. And the reason for this, I think, is largely due to the stark contrast we see between digital computers and the types of uh, computational paradigms that, are, that we see in the brain. So things like how signals uh, are, are transmitted across the system, uh, the precision uh, that we we see in those two um, those two different platforms, parallelism and so on, are very different uh, in computers and biological uh, brains. And really, what that has led to is a huge difference in terms of size, weight, and power consumption uh, between those two platforms. And so as a result, what we have is that current artificial intelligence lacks a few things that, that we would like it to have. First of all, it lacks agility. So uh, applications where size and weight limits um, really dictate the type of, of uh, technology we can have on board um, really aren't accessible by current AI. Current AI also lacks energy efficiency. So Power consumption is uh, actually too large for um, uh, either battery operated or energy harvesting uh, uh, platforms that are out in the field. And so one example is that we can think of is military uh, Internet of Things, right? So we might have a number of uh, sensors out in the field that each have vastly different um, uh, types of data coming in and need to sort of make sense of that data before it communicates it to a network. And with current AI techniques, um, uh, pushing that intelligence from the network right onto the sensors uh, is very challenging because of uh, essentially the, the power requirements and the computational requirements that are required by uh, essentially deep learning um, today. So, what our group does is we sort of rethink uh, AI at all layers of the stack. So our idea is we want to move really from algorithm-driven uh, hardware to hardware-driven algorithms. And we want to think about the brain as sort of a guiding example of how we can achieve truly energy-efficient and agile AI, and this is really a multi-disciplinary uh, effort. So our lab's mission statement is basically we are interested in advancing the field of artificial intelligence by exploring the interplay between a number of, of different uh, domains that we collaborate uh, with, which is includes neuroscience, uh, machine learning and uh, experts in novel hardware. So let's uh, move on and start to talk about some of the specific uh, subdomains of our research group. So we're using the human brain as sort of a, a guiding example, and there's still a large amount about how the brain performs computations that isn't known. But for the better part of uh, the last century, a lot of work was done on at least getting some sense of the computational motifs that are used in biological uh, nervous systems. And so what we do know about the brain is that it uses networks of uh, information convergence or information uh, integrators 
called neurons, and these basically sum information from other parts of the network and then apply some nonlinear computation, uh, computation to it. We know that, that those neurons are connected to each other through weighted uh, synapses. So synapses in biology communicate to other neurons using neurotransmitters. And so we can model synapses as basically weighted communication pathways uh, throughout our network. We also know that the way that biological systems learn is at least partially achieved by modification of those weighted communication pathways, so modification of those synaptic weights. And finally, we know that the way that the neurons are connected to each other, so the topology or the structure of the network, largely informs the behavior uh, of the network. And we see a lot of different types of neurons, types of topologies, and types of synapses in the human brain. So we should be open to also replicating that diversity in artificial systems. So one of the uh, types of technologies that we've been very interested in for implementing artificial neural networks in hardware is something called a memristor. So for our purposes here, we can think of a memristor as basically just a variable resistor. So we can set its resistance to a value, and when we take the power away from the circuit, that resistance value uh, will be maintained. So it's a non-volatile uh, type of memory element. And the nice thing about it is it really facilitates the three main things that biological synapses facilitate, which are computation, memory, and learning. So we know that resistors, for example, can perform computation just through Ohm's law. So the voltage is equal to the current times the resistance. So we have a multiplication uh, that can be performed by this simple device. Since the resistance value that's stored in the memristor is non-volatile, we can also use memristors as memory elements. And since we can actually modify the resistance of the memristors, we can use those devices to facilitate incremental learning. So our group has looked at a few different uh, circuits where we integrate memristors into artificial neural network hardware as a means of performing synaptic uh, connections between neurons. And so this is just one example where we've taken sort of a common cortical microcircuit that has a presynaptic neuron, a postsynaptic neuron, and then a couple of synapses in between them. And we've developed some hardware that replicates that functionality by integrating memristors with uh, what's essentially um, called a current mirror. And so these are the CMOS or conventional uh, IC technology types of devices. Let me see if I can get my pointer here, okay. So these CMOS devices form current mirrors, and these uh, memristor devices basically store the synaptic weight that allows a presynaptic neuron to either uh, attenuate a postsynaptic neuron or amplify the response of a postsynaptic neuron. And so that's just one example of how we can use these types of devices to design very compact uh, hardware for uh, synaptic communication in artificial neural networks. We can also take these memristor devices and because they have such a simple structure, they only have two terminals, we can uh, integrate them into very high density uh, crossbars where essentially we have some number of, uh, we'll say N squared uh, devices, so N squared memristors, or where we can think of them as synapses really, that can be addressed by just two times N uh, different 
different ports. So we're looking at uh, columns basically on this crossbar, right, and rows crossbar. And so these columns plus these rows, we can think of as the uh, ways that we address all the different memristors in this structure. And this is a very compact way uh, to address a lot of different devices using very little interface circuitry. So we've designed a number of different uh, methods specifically for, for how we do this. Uh, some are based on uh, voltage mode techniques, some are based on current mode techniques. And the, the main point here is that regardless of whether or not we're using voltage or current mode or, or regardless of the exact details, we basically have a nice, simple, compact circuit that's really representing all of the memories and all of the sort of communica uh, communication pathways between two entire layers of neurons in our artificial neural network. So we can uh, build this up even further and we can think about taking these memristor devices and these memristor crossbar circuits and integrating them into very energy efficient neural cores, which can then communicate with each other over a network on chip. And so I'm showing one example here of a design uh, that we developed a few years ago where we have again, one of these memristor crossbars that is storing synaptic weights. And then we have some interface circuitry that can perform different neuron level computations, whether it's nonlinear uh, activation functions or uh, doing other sorts of post-processing uh, to get that signal ready to send to the rest of our network. So if we think about how something like this, how this type of memristor crossbar based circuit would compare to a state of the art uh, CPU, at least for neural network types of computations, we see, um, especially on the bottom uh, table here, that the memristor based implementations can actually give us hundreds of thousands uh, improvement in power efficiency over something like a CPU. So uh, here we're saying, uh, we're comparing to what's called a, a risk processor. So that's a reduced instruction set um, computer. And we see again that we have close to 200,000 X improvement uh, in power efficiency because we're in, uh, integrating these very low power memristor devices uh, into our circuit. Okay, so in terms of applications of, um, of this type of research, we've thought about, uh, one, one thing that we've thought about is how we can design an architecture for simultaneous localization and mapping. So this is, uh, yes. Was there a question? No, I think you're, I think you can proceed. Okay. So simultaneous localization and mapping, we can, we can think about, uh, this sort of scenario where we have maybe a drone or some other uh, robot that's in sort of an unfamiliar location is trying to find uh, some target and maybe it doesn't have GPS connectivity. So it has to uh, simultaneously locate something and to do so it has to sort of map its environment uh, as it moves throughout it. And so we've been looking at the idea that we could use a different flavor of these memristor devices. In this case, uh, we're considering what are, what are called gated memristors. So instead of just having two terminals, they actually have three terminals. And we can 
uh, basically use those to implement this uh, or to integrate into a SLAM architecture and get uh, very efficient localization and mapping. Um, and this, this third terminal essentially allows us to do a few things over the two terminal devices. So first of all, it allows us to simultaneously uh, read and write to the device. It reduces uh, something that we call sneak paths, which is basically something that leads to uh, sort of increased power consumption. So it helps us read power consumption. Sneak paths can also lead to basically erroneous reading of the memristor state. And so it also helps us uh, improve upon that. And the other, the other nice thing is, the other nice thing is that it helps us reduce uh, right voltage and power consumption. So we've developed not just synapses for this SLAM architecture, but we need neurons to go along with them. And so we've designed some spiking uh, neurons. So these are basically neurons that behave very similar to the biological neurons that we see in uh, in our own nervous system. So this is the uh, circuit design. It's a fairly basic design that uses some feedback uh, in order to generate a spike. And you can see the behavior of it uh, in this plot here where over time, as we uh, put some current into the input of, uh, of the circuit, eventually it integrates up to a point and reaches a threshold and then produces a spike. So you'd see something very similar to this coming out of uh, the neurons in your brain, for example. And we've done some other characterizations like how uh, their frequency uh, can increase as we uh, basically apply more current uh, into the input of the neuron. So putting these two things together, the uh, synapse designs and the neuron designs, we've developed sort of uh, a preliminary architecture for simultaneous localization and mapping. And I won't go through all the details here, but we've essentially found that we can very efficiently, at least in a constrained environment, in a lower dimensional environment, so in this case, just two dimensions, we can perform uh, basically landmark uh, finding through uh, through learning and with very low low power. So this I think this slide uh, gives a nice example. So the task for our robot was essentially to find a blue target in our environment. So it started at the green. And the first, uh, the first part of the algorithm, basically, the uh, robot is just exploring the environment. So it comes across red, another red, and orange, and then it finally finds the blue target. And along the way, it's making associations between its location and the types of landmarks it's seen. And then in the second trial, it has learned to go directly from the green starting point to the blue target because of those associations that it's made. So this work is in uh, collaboration with uh, a faculty member at University of Cincinnati, and we're uh, trying to apply uh, for some funding right now to actually get this to the next step, which is fabricating uh, a chip that can uh, sort of give us a proof of concept of this architecture. So moving on now from what's happening at the circuit level to the architecture level. So all of our circuits, we can integrate into larger designs very efficiently by thinking about what are called random neural network topologies. So we know that state-of-the-art deep learning algorithms aren't typically random. So all the parameters in those networks are trained through something like backpropagation. 
which is basically a gradient descent type of algorithm. However, in hardware, we get different types of randomness, so different types of stochastic behavior uh, for free from a lot of different underlying mechanisms. And so if we can think about how we can use that random behavior in a useful way, then we can get very, very efficient uh, implementations of AI. And so the idea is that we have artificial neural network topologies now with some sort of fixed uh, and random synaptic weights. And as I said, we can really leverage the natural stochastic behavior of devices like memristors. And if we're only learning now a subset of the parameters in our network and leaving some of them as just fixed random values, we're also going to get a very uh, largely running cost. So I've uh, drawn just one example of what a general random uh, neural network topology might look like here. So this is essentially uh, a network where the output weights, so the weights between the neurons in the output and the layer before the output, those are trained. So we have to do some training in order to get the network to perform the tasks that we want it to. But all of the other synaptic weights, whether they're feed forward in this case or they're feedback, so recurrent, those can be fixed and random, or some subset of those can be fixed uh, and random. So there's a few different flavors of how this uh, might look like in particular, and, we, and we've looked at um, basically each case. So in the case where we only have feed forward random weights, uh, this is actually an idea that was proposed uh, a while back uh, by Huang at, uh, and his coworkers. And the type of network, uh, so this type of network is called a, an extreme learning machine. And the idea is that we take some data, we cast it randomly into a high dimensional space using these random weights. And then we learn the features, the random features in that space by performing some simple linear regression uh, analysis. And so we've uh, built different hardware architectures that can do this very efficiently. Uh, and tested it on a number of data sets, including the handwritten uh, digit classification data set MNIST. So in the case where we actually have not just feed forward weights, but we have some feedback in our network, we generally classify these types of uh, neural networks as reservoir computing. And this is Basically, we can think of a recurrent version of the network that we just that we just looked at. So the idea is still the same. We're going to take our input data and we're going to cast it into this high dimensional random feature space. But now we have feedback and that what that feedback affords us is some sort of temporal memory. So now instead of just looking at sort of static uh, types of data sets, so data sets that don't have any temporal data, we can actually start to look at time series data. And so we've built reservoir computing uh, architectures in our lab that can do things like detect epileptic seizures. Uh, we've also used reservoir computing for identifying individuals based on how they walk, so uh, gate classification. And we've looked at a few other sort of uh, temporal uh, types of problems using this this technique. So to me, I think the most surprising thing is that we can actually use this idea of random weights even with the most state-of-the-art types of neural networks. And these are the deep learning neural networks that are being used in all of the image classification uh, types of types of work that that a lot of universities and a lot of companies uh, are are pursuing, 
And so the idea here was we basically were interested in if we took one of these deep learning uh, convolutional neural networks, which have all of these sort of 2D spatial filters, and we replace those filters with just random weights, we we're wondering what type of uh, response we would get from the network. And so what we found was uh, pretty interesting. So in this image here, what I'm showing is the uh, type of image that would maximally uh, maximal, give a maximal response, essentially, from different random filters. Okay, so in some cases, we see that random filters are maximally responsive to random images. So that's kind of what we expected to see throughout. But in other cases, we see that even random filters are maximally responsive to very regular types of features in the image, like different sort of grading patterns, different kinds of uh, edge patterns in different orientations, and different types of patterns that maybe select uh, interior parts of the image more or less than uh, external uh, parts of the image. And so what we did is we took this idea and uh, we trained a neural network, a convolutional neural network, on uh, synthetic aperture radar data. And what we found was that we can achieve state-of-the-art uh, classification accuracy, so close to 100% um, test accuracy using a convolutional neural network with almost entirely random filters. So just a little bit of training on the output layer was all that was needed. And so the, I think this was a really uh, surprising result, and I think it highlighted that a lot of the deep learning neural networks that we see today are incredibly over-parameterized, and there's a nice opportunity to reduce the size of those networks and to make them more compact, especially for embedded applications. So we've also some, uh, done some statistical modeling of these random uh, neural networks. Uh, so we've this is a bit math heavy, so I won't go through all the details, but we basically have found that if we have uh, less, much less data than the size of our model, which might be the case uh, when we have uh, data sets that are basically hard to collect or hard to label or you know, might be in some kind of a restricted domain, then we get um, sort of very uh, interesting behavior as the size of that data set sort of approaches the size of our model. And in fact, if we have a number of uh, training data that is equal to the size of our, monitor, uh, of our model, then we found that we actually have maximized the amount by which our model can overfit uh, to the data. So it is sort of in summary of that, why that's important is we need to be aware of the size uh, of our model in order to select a data set size that sort of uh, either avoids this area or we need to get some sort of uh, data augmentation have some kind of data augmentation technique that allows us uh, to basically improve or reduce the amount of overfitting um, that our network is doing. So these are some, some mathematical uh, details. I think in the interest of time, um, I'll, I'll take questions about these uh, offline if there's any interest, but uh, for now, I'm just going to skip over them. So the next step of this this modeling is, and to back up a minute, actually, really the the goal of this is so we have 
networks that are performing well using completely random weights. And so, I mean, curiosity forces us to ask why is that happening? But also if we have some system deployed in mission critical applications, right? There's gonna be, um, there's there's going to be some reluctance to rely on uh, randomness, right, to produce uh, outputs of these networks. So we need to know, we need to have a better theoretical foundation and, and have a better idea of how and why uh, and, and in what cases these types of networks are going to fail. So next steps uh, re related to this specific project are to basically look at um well look at a few different things but most importantly we one thing we want to know is if we can optimize really the size of our networks when we have random weights uh using some sort of theoretical foundation uh as a guiding principle so again i can take more questions about uh, that offline if anyone's interested so i want to move on now to uh, something that's really interesting, which is the idea that we can actually get really efficient computation in artificial neural networks by leveraging a different way of really representing the data in our networks. And typically the way we represent data, at least in a digital system, is with these sort of uh, place-dependent binary representations. So the idea with a stochastic representation is to basically throw that out and just represent values probabilistically. Okay, so I have an example uh, that I've written here. If we wanted to represent the fraction since the way we would represent this stochastically is we would have a a what I call a stream of bits. So this is basically a sequence of bits. And the probability that any one of these bits is set to one would be three out of seven. So that's how we would represent uh, that information. And we can also represent, for example, uh, negative numbers using this, this technique by modifying it a little bit. So once we have that kind of representation in our system, some really interesting things happen. Namely, we can perform computations on the data very efficiently by using what's called stochastic logic. So we can perform things like multiplication, which would normally take several uh, adder circuits and AND gates. Uh, in this case, using just a single AND gate. So for any uh, arbitrary, we'll say, bit width or, or precision of our two operands, Z1 or Z2, we can get the multiplication of those two values using just a single AND gate. And so that's really a huge, huge savings. And we can do other things like negate values or uh, evaluate um, different polynomials, uh, lots of other things, just by using very simple digital logic circuits with information that's encoded probabilistically. So one of the places we have been thinking about using this is in the training algorithm that's used to uh, basically get neural networks to learn some particular task. And so these neural networks are usually trained by using some flavor of what's called gradient descent learning. And so some of you might know this uh, as backpropagation. And the idea is that we look at how the cost or how um, basically how well our network is doing. And so we call that the cost function. We look at the cost function and how it changes as we change different parameters in the network. And then we use that to inform how we should change the parameters in the network incrementally. And when you actually implement this in practice, the uh, amount by which you have to change a, a parameter, in this case, it's one of our synaptic weights, becomes really a product of several different uh, partial derivatives 
of our cost function. So in other words, we have several multiplications that have to take place. And so that can be expensive, right? In digital hardware, I just said it requires several adders and AND gates. In analog hardware, it requires analog multipliers. Uh, so in both cases, that can be very expensive. So we've tried uh, to think about how we can actually reduce the cost of this computation using this idea of stochastic logic. And we've found, for example, that in one uh, type of gradient descent algorithm, which is uh, related to something called the perceptron learning rule, where we basically are looking at the error uh, between our uh, network output and our expected output, as well as the input to the network. So we have to perform a multiplication between those two things. And to do that, we replace the analog multiplier with just a stochastic uh, an AND gate, basically, that performs multiplication using uh, stochastic representations. And so what we found was that in the case of the stochastic implementation, we get about at least three and a half times area reduction uh, over the analog uh, implementation. And the good news is that both implementations give us identical results when we implement them into a neural network that learns something like the MNIST uh, digit classification data set. So we took this idea even further and we thought about how we can actually not just implement the training part of our uh, neural network, but the entire network, so synapses and neurons as well, using stochastic logic. And so this is uh, one example of, of a network, uh, neural network that we designed that is a recurrent neural network. So this is one of those reservoir computing uh, algorithms that we designed. And the entire thing you can see, um, with the exception of maybe a couple of interface nodes, is just simple digital logic circuits. So we have some XNOR gates, we have some multiplexers, and we have uh, some flip-flops. And the interesting thing that we found is that for classification problems, so where we're trying to determine if an input belongs to, say, class A or class B, we can actually outperform the deterministic design of this. So that's the design where we're not using stochastic logic. Uh, and the reason is that the, represent, the stochastic representation that we're using sort of inherently adds noise to our algorithm. And that noise turns out to become a useful tool for making sure that we don't overfit our training data. Uh, so, for example, what I'm showing here is we have two lines that say L equal infinity. So those are the performance of the deterministic algorithm. And you see that if we make our stochastic representation large enough, we are actually able to outperform uh, those deterministic designs. So we've also looked at uh, how we can actually implement this on something like an FPGA. So this would be something that could be out in the field for uh, uh, immediate or near-term uh, kind of use. We found that in terms of uh, area on the FPGA, so how much of, of the uh, board we took up essentially, if we can uh, perform the binary to stochastic number conversion efficiently, then we would be able to get a huge savings in uh, the amount of, of real estate on the FPGA. But currently, the way we're currently doing it uh, basically tells us that 
we're going to have about the same amount of area taken up, uh, about the same amount of area uh, as we did in the de uh, deterministic design. So we're currently looking at uh, essentially ways to improve this binary to stochastic uh, conversion using different noise sources. So some future uh, work that our group is interested in, and I'd be happy to you know talk about any more of this offline or uh, when we when we get to questions. So we're always looking for more biological uh, inspiration. Um, one of the things that we're currently working on that I, I didn't have a slide for is how we can actually look at how the brain optimizes its energy usage and how we can try to emulate that in hardware and essentially have AI hardware that not only learns a specific task, but learns how to do it in an energy efficient way. Uh, we've also recently been very interested in what's called adversarial machine learning. So adversarial machine learning is a really hot topic these days, and it's essentially related to the idea that current state-of-the-art deep learning algorithms are brittle in the sense that small modifications of inputs to those types of algorithms uh, can be used to fool the algorithm in a malicious way. And so our group is interested in uh, how that translates to the context of hardware. So when we have AI implemented in hardware, what are the unique hardware characteristics that are either going to help to mitigate uh, the possibility of some of those attacks, or what are the characteristics of hardware that might make those systems more susceptible to those kinds of attacks? Finally, there's a number of uh, application spaces that our group is interested in. Uh, my main interest, which I guess is sort of motivated by my time at Air Force Research Lab, is really uh, defense applications, so military. Uh, IoT, uh, remote sensing, and space situational awareness are um, some of the areas where we've we've been thinking about applying uh, some of this technology. Uh, and so with that, I know we got a little bit of a, a late start, so I hope there's still some time for questions. But uh, thank you very much for listening, and I'll take uh, any questions you might have. Okay, thank you, Corey. That's uh, your doing some uh, cutting edge state of the art work there and we appreciate you uh we appreciate your efforts uh in 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 this area. So we do we do have a couple uh questions that we'll get to and if um uh, anybody else is uh online and has has any others uh feel free to uh text them in there or uh, chat in the chat uh, area there. So one of the first questions I think it was back uh with your um the area of the ran, random neural net topologies, and the individual mm -hmm. was curious as to uh, what size array did you use for your uh, proof of concept uh, activity there? So we've we've looked at a, a few different random uh, neural network topologies. So I think um, if if we're talking about the sort of feed forward flavor which uh, we used for some image classification tasks, then I believe we looked at something like maybe 64-ish uh, uh, neurons in our hidden layer. And in some cases, we may have actually had two hidden layers uh, of around 64 uh, neurons. Now, having said that, one thing to know is that Right, nothing nothing comes for free. So, if if we're not training our network and we're relying on random features to tell us something useful about uh, our inputs, then the prob of course the probability that we're going to get the right random features increases as we increase the size of our network. So typically, we have to have a little bit larger networks um, when we're working with 
uh, when we're working with random uh, projections. But the, the upside is even though those networks are larger, the implementation might still be smaller because the circuitry that's required or not required rather to train those weights uh, gives us a huge savings. Okay, great. Thanks for uh, fielding that question. Uh, we have uh, another one dealing with the uh, reservoir com uh, computing. And the uh, question is, how, how do you get the digital result? And is there an A to D step in the uh, I.O. process? Sure. So I think, uh, I think that's probably a question about the stochastic uh, implementation of the reservoir computing. And so, yes, there is, um, there has to be some, if, if we're working with real world signals, then there has to be some sort of uh, A to D uh, conversion that would go from, let's say, audio coming in uh, and then go through our binary to stochastic uh, conversion process. And so the, a the ATD can be, uh, can be costly. And so we're not, we're not claiming necessarily that uh, we've removed that bottleneck, but if the implementation was already digital, then moving from a deterministic to a stochastic implementation does give us significant area savings. Okay, great. So I think, um, so, yep. I, I'm sorry, did you have something more to add? Uh, no, I think that was it. So uh, I think that was the first part of the question. Uh, could you repeat the oh, second okay. part of the question? Oh uh, well, I, so the it, it was uh, how do you get the digital result in the reservoir computer? I think it, it said is you know it, it was the how do you, how do you get the digital result in the with the reservoir computer and is there an A to D step in the uh, I/O? Those were the that that was the question. Okay, okay, yeah. So so in summary, yes, there's a there's an analog to digital conversion in the I/O. Okay, I think the uh, uh, the, gen the gentleman was happy uh, with the answer. You, uh, you 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 covered you covered what he was what he was looking to uh, what he was looking for. Um, so I'm I'm kind of curious. Um, what you know? What, what do you see? You know, in your work here, what is what do you think are some of the uh, you know bigger challenges um, you know that you you might face in trying to move this uh, research uh, forward in this area? Sure. So there's a couple. Uh, I think one of the main ones is how how do we know when we've done a good job? Um, everyone wants to know when they've done a good job, right? So there's there's this big issue with with sort of benchmarking these kinds of systems. Um, so each you know there's a lot of universities and companies that are working on this this kind of research and each one sort of uh, uses maybe a slightly different benchmark to compare their work with other work. Uh, sometimes it's, it's you know, to show their work in, in the best light. Uh, and sometimes it's just because there aren't better benchmarks available. So something that our group is sort of interested in is sort of kind of a one-off uh, side project that we're, we're collaborating with uh, some, some other folks on is developing better benchmarks that don't just tell us, for example, uh, how much, you know, how power efficient our system is, or don't just tell us how accurate our system is, but tries to sort of incorporate everything that we want in these types of systems. So learning capability, um, expected performance on certain types of problems, uh, energy efficiency, right? All of those sorts of things into a single, a, a, either a single sort of quantifiable uh, benchmark or set of benchmarks. And our approach has uh, been to use 
some concepts from information theory that we are seeing being applied to some of the uh, deep learning algorithms uh, recently, actually. And they're being applied basically to sort of uh, remove the black box, right, from the algorithm and get a better idea of uh, what's going on inside. So uh, benchmarking, I'd say, is probably the, the biggest challenge uh, going forward. OK, thanks for. Uh... Thanks for uh, elaborating on that. And uh, so I've got one other thing I'll throw out at you. And I'm just wondering if there are any other specific characteristics of the brain, you know, that, that might shed some light on how to, how to improve uh, artificial intelligence? Sure. So uh, in, in this talk, I highlighted, um, you know, things that are very well known from the neuroscience community. So, uh, you know, we know that there's different types of networks in the brain and, and they're composed of neurons and synapses. And so uh, the, the work on artificial neural networks spans all the way back, you know, to the 1940s and even before. But I think more recently we're seeing some very fundamental differences in artificial, between artificial neural networks and the way or the paradigm that's used in biology to perform computation, which is becoming informative. So one difference is the amount of uh, recurrency that we see in biology. The state-of-the-art deep neural networks are mostly feed-forward, um, so they don't really have a lot of, of, of feedback from, we'll say, uh, more uh, abstract informa uh, information representations back down to more, uh, we'll say, raw information representations. But in the brain, we see a whole lot of that. And uh, one of our group's hypotheses is that that's actually something that if we add to artificial neural networks could help substantially in, in reducing the susceptibility of these algorithms to different types of adversarial uh, attacks. So the the second thing that I'll uh, I'll mention is the sort of whole other type of uh, cell that we see uh, in neural networks, which are neural glia. So these actually outnumber neurons in our brain, but we don't typically see them in uh, we don't typically see them incorporated into artificial neural networks because I think until recently it was thought that they were just sort of a support structure for neurons. But some of the new research suggests that they actually perform um, very important computational roles. They help to regulate energy uh, in the network. And so I think looking, taking a closer look at the functions those are performing in a biological setting and thinking about how we can maybe emulate some of that in artificial systems uh, is really important going forward. So I'm, I'm, I'm not a, not a hundred percent sure of this, but I thought, I thought I heard, I thought I recall that uh, they, uh, <clears throat> they had actually dissected uh, Einstein's brain and when they did the analysis on it, uh, I, I think they they found that he had like a, high, a much higher percentage of glial cells than like the average person. So so there could be something, you know, there there could be something, uh, you know, there to those, you know, a, you know, trying to add that into your, in, you know, into your uh, your research. That 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 could be uh, that could be an interesting area for exploration. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So I, I've heard that as well. Um, yeah, I, I think I think there's just a whole lot about the brain that's still unknown, and there's a lot of exciting research coming out, you know, every day. And so I think just being vigilant and, and keeping an eye on what the neuroscience community is doing, uh, and trying to to use that information to improve our systems, our artificial systems. Uh, I think that's that's basically the key. 
Well, uh, Dr. Merkel, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to share your uh, your research uh, with us. Uh, like I said, very very interesting uh, work you're doing, and I'd like to thank the uh, audience for uh, for uh, joining us today. And uh, Corey, if you have any any last words, uh, you can. Uh, sure. So yeah, I want to again. I want to thank uh, uh, Steve and John and, and Joe Caroli uh, for inviting me to to give this talk. Um, apologize, we got off to a little bit of rough, a little bit of a rough start, but uh, hopefully I provided some some useful information to everyone out there in uh, in webinar land. And um, I hope everyone's uh, you know in light of recent events, staying safe and healthy and uh, Feel free to uh, you know follow up on any points that you uh, think are interesting. You can certainly find my email online, and I'd be happy to talk about anything else uh, that you might be interested in. Okay, that's great. So, uh, so folks, uh, like you said, Corey, Corey said, if you have questions for him, he's happy to uh, happy to take your questions. And uh, once again, thanks for joining us, and look forward to seeing you at a future webinar. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. We'll uh, talk to you soon. Bye-bye now.